My name is Jeremy Newman and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to come here tonight to introduce you to uh, a radical new way of thinking about identity, uh, verification and uh, its uh, fraudulent use. Now, let me set the scene because I've got two halves to this and I'd like to stop in the middle and get your feedback because really there's the principle of the solution that we're proposing and then there's the implementation as two separate things. Uh, so essentially, let me set the scene. We have a pernicious problem which is affecting developed nations across the entire globe. And consequently, organizations are suffering under the burden of huge losses and considerable costs. And this then feeds through into causing misery for uh, helpless individuals. And then uh, finally you have uh, organized crime, international crime being fed by this uh, particular problem. Now, that describes identity fraud today, but it isn't something we haven't seen before in a slightly different guise. So I'm referring to the problem of uh, longitude in the 18th century, which is when you're out in the clear blue ocean and all you've got around you is uh, 360 degrees of sea, no landmarks, uh, where are you? And there's two pieces of data you need to find out where you are. One is easy, which is latitude, um, take the angle of the sun at uh, noon or off the north star to the horizon. And the other one is longitude. Latitude, no problem at all, everyone could do it. Longitude, well because the earth is spinning, the heavens are moving and people are trying to find all different, different kinds of ways of doing this. And uh, this uh, was fixed at the time by mariners who would do something called dead reckoning. So they plot their position on the chart each day. And they'd work out their heading, their compass direction, and their speed. And to work out their speed, they'd chuck a log over the side and they'd watch it recede into the distance and they'd time that and that would be their speed. Dead reckoning. It sort of worked, but not very well. This was no abstract problem. This actually cost people their lives, shipwrecks. It cost a huge amount of lost trade, uh, just as there was an explosion in trade internationally. And uh, you not only lost your ship, your cargo and your trade, um, because ships didn't know where to go, they would stick to known shipping lanes which made it easy for the pirates and then you had national uh, security problems because of piracy and naval tragedies so um, there were some serious uh, shipwrecks where as many as 2,000 sailors were lost um, out of four uh, ships. And this is very similar to the identity fraud problem today which is working out who you are when you're on a, essentially a clear blue ocean of uh, internet commerce, how do you figure out who you're dealing with? So, like latitude, there's an easy part of the problem, which is individuators. In other words, figuring out which person you're dealing with. So we use today simple, universal individuators like name and address, date of birth, social security number. It doesn't really matter what it is. And that tells you which person you're dealing with. Is it really them? That's the differentiator. And it's pretty difficult to do that. And so far, somebody had a bright idea back in Captain Mannering's day, I know Pike will ask them their mother's maiden name because nobody else will know that. And they went on from biographical data, date of birth, um, to so-called secrets, so passwords and pins and what's your mother's uh, pet's cousin's first uh, birthday. And so uh, apart from secrets, you have documents such as uh, passports and driver's license, which are now being forged on a, an industrial scale. And, uh, and finally, we've got to the rather mad situation of actually creating a false asymmetry in the population by making hardware devices and distributing them everywhere to everybody and have people sitting there and keying in uh, numbers uh, like they're monkeys. And the costs, well, the statistics are out there. Um, it's a pretty serious problem, not just in terms of the money. The cubic volume of dollars in the States last year, I was quite surprised, is $37 billion. Uh, in this country, it's 1.9 billion pounds. That's probably something we could do within the economy. Um, and we could do without all the hassle of having to deal with identity fraud when it happens um, and the cost spent on cleanup and detection. And the fallout from that is rather like piracy on the blue seas. You have phishing, dark markets, and data breaches, which you heard about a bit earlier. Uh, reputational damage amongst the uh, organizations that are dealing with customers. And uh, the burden is placed on the honest majority. So, You've only got a tiny number of uh, fraudulent transactions to detect, but everybody has to come through with this uh, business of remembering uh, and keeping secrets and uh, you know, not divulging passwords and pins and shredding their 
rubbish and all the rest of it. So what's different? What can we do now with the recent advances in technology? So uh, the big one, as far as we're concerned, is the fact that the internet is now beginning to look back at us. We have camera ubiquity in, in cell phones, webcams, and everybody is very familiar with the business of throwing digital media around. Now, the origin of identity is having run a biometrics firm for 10 years, um, we came to the stunning realization that the best biometric engines on the planet are, in fact, people. They're really good at recognizing people that they know. They're not very good at recognizing people they don't know or comparing people that they don't know. Well, when a security guard looks at a photograph on a card and looks at the person standing there, they have no idea what to do. It's a uh, very, very poor performance if you actually uh, measure it, which has been done with uh, Glasgow University. So this has obviously been a, a matter of survival. Um, and we also realize that really nobody is who they say they are. They are only who other people say they are. So it comes from your identity, essentially. You know, you're born, you're given a name, and you get known as something. But your identity is ecstatic. It comes from outside yourself. So can we really use this in order to address the one single cause of identity fraud, which is organizations don't know people? They just haven't got a clue who they're dealing with. People know people. So they have the solution. People have the solution within themselves. Just simply by recognizing people that they know and uh, rejecting people they don't. As we would say in Somerset, the answer lies in the soil. So it's all out there. The question is, how do you actually map it? So if you take that original diagram, so you've got a Venn diagram, if you will, of the entire population of the planet, and you have that little red dot there, which is you the subject. There are some people around here who know what you look like and they would know what you sound like within half a syllable of picking up the phone. Um, they would know who you were and you would know who they are. And it's very similar across a crowded room and so forth. We're highly adapted in order to be able to do this. And so we've redefined what a fraudster is. A fraudster is not somebody who doesn't know your mother's maiden name or hasn't found it out or hasn't fished it or whatever. It's somebody who is not recognized by the family or the friends of their victim. So our, our, uh, our belief is, is that instead of trying to identify customers, instead of putting the burden on the honest majority in order to regurgitate these, these facts and remember passwords and so forth, um, you shift the burden onto the fraudster and say, we can detect fraudsters 100% 100, 100 of the time if we can simply put this solution together. So the premise is, is that we map. There is a known solution set for everyone in this room, everybody in this city, everybody in this country, everybody in the world. There is a known solution set that could be mapped of who knows what you look like. And so we map this ability to recognize one another, and then we harness it in order to detect all fraudsters. I mean, I just wanted to kind of gain this baseline, really, because we're all running around with our heads cut off, and people are getting very excited about identity. But, duh, we have eyes and ears, right? And we can now hook those eyes and ears back into the internet. So anyway, moving onwards. So mapping the, co the, the population and the ability to recognize. How am I doing for time? OK, so we have some very carefully, specially choreographed social collaboration by which people can actually establish, first off, a photograph of what they look like. So what we call reference media. So we start with photos, but we move on to audio recordings of your voice and video recordings and all the rest of it. And they're cross-verified by people who know you. And your photograph is cross-verified by them. And we can move on to do, uh, optionally, audio and video recording. And you've heard of the social gesture, the like button from Facebook and the Foursquare check-in. We've developed another uh, verb, if you will, the recognized verb, the recognized gesture. Uh, so if you get to get onto this system, you have to you'll get presented with a grid of photographs, right? So there are eight dummies there and one real guy, or one dummy and nine fake photographs, whatever. So you have uh, a, a question here, do you recognize any of these people? If you don't, you click here. We can make that button bigger. I mean, this is just a prototype. And that's the fraud signal. Okay? So 
I don't know who the hell that is. Goodbye fraudster. That's how you stop the fraudster. If you do know somebody there, you click on the photo, and then you go through to the second stage, which is here are a list of 10 first names, 10 last names, pick the right first name, pick the right last name. Thank you very much. And we don't give you any feedback on that to say whether you're right or wrong, it's just thank you very much. You have to be invited onto this dedicated special purpose social graph, as it were. The inviter has to be recognized by the invitee and uh, vice versa, of course. And before you can invite somebody else on, you have to um, put an individuator, a, lock, a lookup handle onto the network. So basically you say, this is my address. And you, we ask people, and this is where it gets a bit sort of, whew, you have to put in the address that the fraudster would quote when pretending to be you, right? Because when they do that, and they would do that because they're trying to get access to your resources, your money, whatever, when you do that, then of course everything points to your reference media, which has been verified by your, your referees, essentially. So the idea here is to help organizations help people, um, or sorry, help people to help organizations to obtain this differentiation, this second axis. So the identifiers are easy, whether it's your credit card number or your address, and then the differentiation. So you can either call on the reference media. So for instance, this boils down into the first uh, instantiation is electronic photo ID. So instead of putting a photograph on a piece of plastic and saying, this is me, trust me, the photograph is now on a server, okay? There's no card to forge. And the photograph has been vouched for by people in the network who have in turn been vouched for and so forth. Um, and um, you can also call, I mean, this is a downstream of it, our vision is, is that you'll be calling on a live referee to say, I don't know who that is, or yes, that's Jeremy. So a simple example, somebody walks into a bank uh, and the subject makes an identity claim. The teller, the, the clerk doesn't know them from Adam, but fortunately, their reference photo can be looked up and it appears on the screen in front of them. That's one scenario. Another scenario is where that business of comparison, which we know to be weakly performed by people who don't know the uh, subject, uh, can be outsourced. Uh, essentially, the subject makes the same identity claim. Um, a camera takes a photograph of who's there, and it gets shipped off into the network, and the result, pass or fail, comes back. Now, that result can be worked out in a number of ways. Um, at the moment, we've got a prototype running um, on this Android phone here. We have an app called uh, Glass Slipper. So you take a photograph of somebody, and if it's a photograph of you, the owner of this device, it'll say uh, the shoe fits. And if it's anybody or anything else, it'll say ugly sister. And that comparison is done in the background by using the Amazon Mechanical Turk. So we've farmed out the reference photograph and the one that's just been captured with the phone off to about 10 people who don't know the subjects in question, but some of those people are really good at comparing faces, and we know it because we've qualified them. Okay, so just summarizing on where we got to on the solution. So in the old model of identity, everybody vouches for themselves. It's a strict one-to-one, -one. so from the organization to the, to the customer and back, to the hell with everybody else. They prove who they are, and anybody else can be them, because anybody here who finds out the person's next to them, uh, their secret information, then they're toast. And the, the burden is to identify each customer. In the new model, I don't vouch for myself, I vouch for other people in society, in my network, and they vouch for me, and nobody else can be me. I mean, that's really the world we're trying to create here. Nobody else can be you with this system, because your friends and family will stop it, stop it happening. So instead of identifying everybody, we detect all fraudsters. Um, now I'm going into the sort of specifics of what you actually, what we've actually built so far. So there's the there's two halves to this. As I say, there's a mapping half and there's a harnessing half. On the mapping half, we've developed something called ID Angels, which is the membership system. Because it's fair enough to say this could be done, but why should people volunteer their photographs and how and, and so forth? So. The idea here is that um, the angel has a sort of benevolent uh, uh, association uh, in the background. Um, so ID Angels is the, uh, essentially the social graph. And uh, the other half, which is business facing, is uh, this vehicle called Reality Check, Fraud Detection Services, Low Level Web Services API. And it allows um, organizations to use this uh, service to um, differentiate uh, fraudsters from real people at the point of encounter. So face-to-face -face over the 
uh, phone or uh, using web. Um, so in a face-to-face -face setting, I've kind of said all this really, seeing a photograph um, or submitting it for uh, a comparison. So the business model is that ID Angels is free to join, it's voluntary, and you do it by uh, invitation only, while businesses pay for fraud detection, usage-related fees, whether it's in-source or outsource. I've mentioned this app as well. Um, and uh, we lay these things out in what we call the identity trinity because we found that all this thinking had been done before. You only have to look back 300 years and it's all been sorted, right? So on one hand, we have a kind of uh, legislature, which is where the identity comes from. You have an executive um, identity of the people who wants to know, you know who they're dealing with. And we also see that downstream some way, there's going to be the need for an independent body in the middle to arbitrate and dispute between these two. So the database is built here, and it's used here. But these people can't just do dis, uh, sort of random indiscriminate lookups to look up, say, find out where somebody lives. Uh, the system here doesn't allow you to do that. You have to provide the name and address in order to do um, a reality check. I think that's it. So we're advocating that we're in a malaise of, of, on identity fraud. Um, it's just going on, it's costing us a lot of money. But we're in the age of the customer now. We're in the age of the sensory internet. And it's about time that these highly adapted devices known as eyes and ears uh, get used in order to uh, protect the people that you care about. Yeah, I, I really like this idea. It seems like a, a great concept, and you told a really good story um, about how it works. Thank you. But one of but. the uh, w one of the things you said was that um, security guards are, or you know, people who don't know the person, are terrible at recognizing a photo. Yeah. And um, all of this seemed to lead up to suddenly depending on someone who doesn't know the person to recognize them. And it feels like you're um, wasting an opportunity. People people um, interact with their contacts by the internet all the time. I mean, yeah. can there be something that takes advantage of that? Like yes, exactly. I mean, we, we basically, if we say, you know, if we describe the vision of where this will end up, then people go, oh, that will never happen, right? So we're saying, okay, you know, you still have that photo ID, so fish the photograph out of your wallet, here's me, all right? We say, well, we'll deal with that. We'll make it so that's software, okay? So, yes, you're right. It's a very lame way of actually starting with just a slow way of starting. So. Um, in, in answer to the business of comparison, what we do with the Amazon Mechanical Turk is that we can characterize for a qualification test whether or not people are good at doing this comparison thing. There are people in this world who are known as super recognizers because they are just phenomenal at recognizing people. And there are people out there who just cannot do it. There's a disease called prosopagnosia where mothers don't even recognize their daughter. It's that bad. They have to look at their shoes to figure out who they're dealing with. Right? Um, so there is a spectrum of ability out there with people who don't know one another and there are sick people who really can't do it but generally speaking all right it's a lot better than what's the main name of your mother's uh, husband right so but the ultimate point of this is not so that everyone's having to deal with photo ID in the classic sense but when you do a transaction on the web right it's this thing here the camera right that's the device that's going to authenticate you it's actually the, the it's that which is through a contemporaneous, spontaneous conversation with somebody who's been chosen at random by the network. So one of your, say, say you've got like 50 referees, 50 people, how many people do know what you look like? Presumably a couple of hundred. Yeah, right, so say you've got 25, 50 of those people who are there on your list of referees who have looked at your photo and go, yeah, that's him, right? So we look one of those up at random who happens to be online or has a phone in their pocket and it goes ping, and they get that grid of photographs. And they go, duh, duh, duh. who the hell is that? Don't know. End of fraud, confirm, that's you through. Okay? So in the future, we believe this will end up with live refereeing where people occasionally get asked to contribute to identity and they often get protected. Um, just a suggestion that I'm sure you thought of and then um, asking another question. But um, to get that, can't you incentivize people where they get some kind of reward if they do identify someone in a period of time or something? We've been thinking about this very carefully for about yeah. six years. Yeah. It's a bit scary. I mean, yeah. agile development, this is not. Yeah. Um, we filed our first patent in 2006. Um, we had it granted in May. That's the sort of cycle time we're dealing with. So in thinking about this stuff, we thought, well, we've had to be very careful about actually making sure we've got the motivations in the right corners. 
And if you start paying people to identify their friends, then it changes the motivation. You get unforeseen consequences. It doesn't take long before you realize, that, oh, dear, that's a bit ugly. But, however, what we're essentially doing is that we're acting as a, a, you know how music publishing, publishing works, okay? So you're the composer, you write a song, I publish it, I give you some of the royalties. Well, it's not beyond uh, the realms of possibility that we pay you every time your photograph is looked up. So we share the revenue with you. So this is essentially a mutual or a cooperative. We're still looking at the business model. Plus, I'm not really sure, maybe you guys can help me with this, how does the insurance industry react to something like this when we can actually provide a, a level of underwriting as to guaranteeing identity, which has hitherto has not been possible? Yeah. Sorry, does that answer your question? Uh, what, I, what I did actually, if you don't mind, um, so I'm launching a crowdfunding platform and we need, we're using Experian and Equifax for identity. Yeah. Um, can you give me like, some ideas of what, would this be ready to use? Do you think, um, how would we use it? And you know, do you think it fits in with that? We, I we think we better to talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Um, given that you've been thinking about this for so long, I assume you've got some answers. I'm interested in the sort of equality, equalities dimension. Yeah. The, I mean, historical concerns about, you know, homeless people not having access to services because they haven't got a date of birth, you yeah. know, difficulties with things being done under power of attorney because power of attorney systems are clunky. As you say, you know, some people have got more friends than others, etc. Yeah. Yes. I mean, it seems like, you know, a solution which runs the risk of you know, being very good for standard people and potentially marginalizing non-standard well, people. Well, it's, it's, uh, it's as good as the community that you think we live in, essentially, so that if you have a doctor and nothing else, then that doctor can, can vouch for you. If you're blind, then of course you can't vouch for other people, but there's a whole load of people who can see who could vouch for you, okay? So when you turn the bag inside out to essentially invert the problem and work out the solution that way up, then it doesn't mean that all the problems disappear, it just means that the whole thing becomes a lot easier. So for people who don't have any digital um, access, we can't help them. For people who are not members of ID Angels, we can't help them, okay? For people who, who are uh, disadvantaged in some way, say for instance they're hard of hearing or hard, uh, they have a um, uh, challenge in terms of being able to see, then they can be helped by other people. So this is very much about, God, I hate to use the term big society, but this is very much a, a matter of actually helping people help themselves, help each other. So I think we're more aligned with the way society works. Yeah. Um, yeah, a couple of comments. Firstly, are you aware that Facebook reverses this process and uses your ability to recognize your contacts as a yeah. way of verifying your, your identity? Yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, we know that Facebook's a social graph, and we looked at actually using Facebook to do this, but then we realized that Facebook hasn't got a great record on privacy. Uh, the actual social collaboration that we felt was required for this needs to be done in a way yeah. which is very rigorous I, I and then, you Sorry. know it's ultimately it's a question of not everybody wants to be a member of facebook yeah so. I, pre I appreciate that i'm not trying to suggest that you that, that you use facebook well, my point was slightly different that face that there's a, a reversal of the process and i wondered if you considered the reverse process in that a unique ability that I have is to identify people from my social network. Yeah. Nobody else can do that because nobody else, my mum doesn't know you, but I know you, yeah. right? So yeah. there's nobody else in my social network other than me that can identify everybody in my social network, right? So Facebook actually uses this. If you ever lost access to your Facebook account, this is how they get into it. Yeah. The other, the other, the yes, other I've seen that, yeah. Okay, the other comment I was going to make is that um, the this system that you've designed will probably work very, very well for non-time sensitive. Um, yeah, when you're, um, when you're doing this in an asynchronous fashion, for example, if I'm setting up a bank account, mm. that would make quite a lot of sense because I don't mind if it takes, you know, 24 hours for my social network to respond, right? But if I need to get through to my bank and make a transaction at 2 o'clock in the morning, the chances of there being anybody in my social network who not only can identify me but can be asked to identify me and can be contacted at that time yeah. is much, much lower. Yeah. So I just wondered if you'd thought through the applications of this technology and how... You don't, because I, I think as a general way of proving your identify, identity, it's a non-starter. But as a second line of defense or some, a use for where there's non-time sensitive applications, it might be a great idea. Yes, I mean, really, we regard this not as so much as a second line of defense, but really a bedrock, the source of truth in all identity. So say, for instance, you want to have a profile where you can open a bank account at 3 a.m. I think that's actually a risk profile right there. But let's say you want to do that. Then a transaction, for example. Yeah, or a transaction. Then 
uh, the question is, is whatever authentication you use in there, okay, what's it, go what's it going to be rooted in? Okay, what do you, wh where do you go when it comes to absolute truth? Where do you go for that? So maybe there is a, a fast means of doing authentication, which you use now, like a password or a PIN or a special token, or a private public key pair, right? But the association, the correlation between that PKI uh, instrument and your identity is done through your social network, through this social network, through, uh, through your referees. So you get from that process a means of doing that sort of fast transaction. But are you proposing that to be real time? Because the thing is, I can't see that that would work in real time. The chance of me, you know, I, when I ring up my bank, I want to be able to get through within, you know, 20 seconds, 30 seconds a minute, that kind of order of time, yeah. right? Yeah. And the chance of me being able to get a single member of my social network to respond to what is a relatively mundane, boring, and quite frankly, irritating request. Well, that's why we have reference media. So we have on file, right? Your, a recording of your voice, or a, a, record, a, a record of your photo, or several records of your photo, and a video of you. So that's there for when your social network is out for lunch. So you then default to that mechanical Turk approach? Well, then. or we, we default to something. At least it's better than nothing, right? Okay. I mean, that's the point. Is that for th this means that the bar is raised to the fraudster. They now have to look like you and sound like you. I'd like to make it so they have to look and sound like you to the satisfaction of your mother and father and cousin and uncle and children. That's not so easy. Okay. You see a lot of um, articles saying that uh, identity fraud is costing us so much and it's a big problem. But um, I'm just interested in how many people have been affected by identity fraud? The point is, is that everybody in here, right, everyone in here can be impersonated by somebody else on the planet while we're sat here. What are we going to do? Anyone got any ideas? I just, uh, just follow up on your point. Um, I just, uh, for example, I, had, I got an HSBC account. We we're just talking about it and it has online banking. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's just completely terrible in a way how many passwords I have to put in for them to identify. And they tell me that it's for my security, but I guess everybody's profile is different. And yeah. for me myself, I would probably, I would just tell them right, right there, you know, all I want is my username and my password, and that's fine. I'm willing to run the risk of somebody hacking into me, kind of because I think the risk is probably quite small. Yeah. And if you think that I have, you know, say 100 grand in there, probably the risk is, I don't know, a tenth of a percent. Yeah. percent. So over the course of next, you know, 10, 20 years, that's fine. You know, the, the cost is 500 pounds to me over the next 20 years. But what I'm trying to say, the idea is great. If you if if you can shift the burden of me jumping through hoops, yeah, that's exactly any point. time to that's somebody exactly else. I mean, I don't know whether they're gonna like that, but I, um, I signed up our company for internet banking mm -hmm. by yeah. the uh, by an unnamed bank, shall we say? And they mm -hmm. said, okay, here are some questions which we need to have the answers to. And one was, what is the middle name of your spouse? All right? And I put it in, and it rejected it. And the message was, no answer can have 50% of the same character. Her wi her, my wife's middle name is Anne, A-N-N. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you know, when it gets to that crazy position, like, and we're all doing this ostensibly to save ourselves or to, you know, to help with security, the truth actually is, is that banks, well, let's say lenders, right, they regard identity fraud as a performance indicator. Oh, you're not really working your systems hard enough unless you've got a certain amount of identity fraud. They regard it as something which is inevitable, right? Well, it, it's just not good enough for us consumers anymore, right? It's got to be done better. We know we have an answer. And with, with respect to you know, the amount of uh, stupid uh, question and answer tricks you've got to go through, it's, it's just getting overburdensome. It really has got too far, yeah. Just a, a final quick point. It's, it's almost a lawful legal issue mm. in that um, one idea of identity is your birth certificate. Yeah. Um, the birth certificate is your identity. It's okay. not, but I... I well, my understanding as is... As far as the state is concerned, it is, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and you have a contract with your birth certificate. So this is an interesting issue in that you're looking at the person, the, the, pe the, the human being, uh, this is entirely sourced from humans. Yeah. There is no reference to documents or databases okay. other than I can see you and you can see me. Hi, Fred. 
you know, hi Jeremy, right? That's the, that's the extent it goes. It does mean that you can walk up to any machine with a camera and you can be authenticated just by saying, hi I'm Jeremy, I'm Jeremy, this is my address. You don't need to have any passwords, none, none, right? So you get people who are saying, here's my credit card, I can pay with this camera thing and have it read. You know, you heard of this company called Jumio out of the States, just raised 24 million so you can scan a credit card using the camera on your machine. Well, I say big deal, throw the card away, you don't need that anymore. Donate it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg. Oh.